Thank you for watching Forage Focus. I'm your host, Christine Gelly, the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Noble County. My guest today is Dan Lima, who works in Belmont County as the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator there. Dan, what are we going to talk about on the show today? So thanks for having me, Christine. Um, we are in Bell Valley, Ohio, and today we will be talking about ways to get a good hay sample and the critical numbers to look at, as well as balancing some feed rations. Stay tuned. One of the things that we did want to talk about is, as you can see behind me is a large round bale. Uh, let's talk about storage and why we harp so much on the importance of storage. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that this bale is just sitting on the ground. There's a large manure pile next to us, um, but it's just a good place to put it. Um, however, or I should say it's a convenient place to put it. However, if you do look at the bale itself, you can see that it's been, because it's so wet and muddy down here, it's been wicking up moisture, and you can already see a loss at the bottom of the bale. I don't know if you can make out, uh, but it's pretty well oxidized. You can see the mud coming through, and it's starting to rot. So there is gonna be some, some uh, loss in dry matter, as well as some nutritional components of the bale itself. What do we call that, that outside layer of typically damaged hay on the bale? So all around the bale, you see this darker, um, almost caramelized colored hay, uh, the grasses. Um, that, that is called a thatch layer. And what happens is uh, from, from weather exposure, moisture, UV light, it creates this oxidized layer. Now uh, that doesn't really have a high nutritional content, but one of the benefits of having a good thatch layer is that it does give you a little protection from the elements. But as you can see, it will start to uh, eat away at the nutritional value of this bale from the outside in. So having it covered and having the bale off the ground, whether it's on gravel, whether it's on a pallet, whether it's in a building even, um, that would be the best case scenario, actually. It's gonna give you major protection in terms of preserving that bale. Up to 50% loss can happen just from storing a bale like this one. We should note that the bale that we're demonstrating on today is net wrapped, and depending on the type of wrap that you choose to use for your bale, a nicely tight wrapped bale with a good net wrap can actually really help uh, from getting too much water into that bale. It can help the water roll off during a rain event. Also, you can wrap bales with plastic to help keep them dry when you're storing hay outside. Uh, so those are some options to help improve your storage for your hay throughout the season. So, uh, we were talking about storage uh, earlier and we were showing you a bale that's been exposed. We talked about the oxidative thatch layer and some of the losses underneath the bale. Um, in this case, what they did was they actually wrapped all the dry bales they had in an inline wrapper. Um, and this, as you can see, is impermeable plastic. It's gonna keep the bale dry, it's gonna keep the elements off. And all that loss that you saw in the other bale that could be as high as 50% is gonna be avoided just by wrapping the bale. Again, other things you could do is just lift it off the ground, cover it somehow, either put a small tarp over each one or have some kind of roof over them. But uh, the important thing is one, it's not touching the ground, it's wicking up that moisture, and it's also not being exposed to sunlight and rain. What we're gonna do next is show you how to take a forage sample on a round bale like this. And Dan, while we're standing at this angle, should we go, what direction should we approach this bale with the forage probe? Well, hopefully we'll go towards the bale. <laughs> and um, he thinks he's here funny. is your soil probe. Um, this one's got the little Penn State crank here. I don't know if you can see that. But a lot of times, this is the probe itself. Um, you can have an attachment that you can put it on a drill and use it that way. But we're going a little uh, old fashioned here. And as soon as I get this back on, we are ready to show you the proper way to make sure that we get a quality sample from this bale. Okay, Dan, so we're ready to take that sample. Everybody note that we are on the wrapped side of the bale, not the exposed side of the bale. We want to do that so that we get through all the layers of the bale rather than just one section, so we have a representative sample. 
Right, so um, one thing you want to do is actually cut the netting. So just a standard knife and we just cut through here. So we get a good area to put our probe through. All right, so let's go ahead and again, here is our soil probe and we are going perpendicular to the bale. That way we get a larger surface area and more representative sample like Christine was talking about. So again, um, this one is just a little harder to do because I got the Penn State crank. <laughs> a lot of people actually prefer the Penn State crank rather than using a drill because sometimes you can get too much power with the drill or not enough. Okay. So it's good to have both options. So we got, we went all the way in, so about three feet, maybe a little bit less than that, but as far as we can go, and the closer we go, the more representative a sample. So now we're gonna pull this out. Dan, could you come up and show the audience the tooth um, part of that probe? Okay. Okay, so there's our sample, going all the way through all the different layers of the bale. And one of the things you want to do now is you want to make sure you're not losing any of the fine dust, any of the, uh, the good leaves in the sample. And then we're going to take a stick here and just push it through, push it out the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Right into the bucket. Now, Dan, how many bales do you think people should sample to get an accurate representation? So again, accuracy or representation is going to be the most important thing. Um, otherwise, what you're doing, one, it's going to waste your time. Two, it's going to be expensive because you're not going to be really doing what's necessary to get the best results. So you want several bales. I would say um, five to ten bales should be good. Uh, the more, the better. The more, but but really, if you can do five bales, I think you're going to be in good shape. Okay. Um, so just do the same thing to several bales, and you'll notice that I pulled I pulled the entire probe out, and we got everything in here from all the fine dust to the thicker um, the thicker grass particles. So you would combine all of the probe samples into your bucket, mix it up, and then use that as your sample to send to the lab. Right. So so in this case. Um, you know, we got one core from this bale, and we have it in this bucket. What we would do is just uh, sample several bales, hopefully from the same field, same um, hopefully cutting. from the same cutting, because those things, so cutting is gonna be crucial for quality, as well as the field. So same field, same cutting, keep together for a representative sample. All right, and now we are back inside. We have our forage test. Remember, we did five to 10 bales, put it in a bucket, got everything mixed up. And what you'll see is there's all kinds of shapes and sizes here. If I were to just reach in and pull out a subsample, all the good stuff is going right in between my fingertips and I'm losing value and I'm also losing the quality that I'm actually feeding. So I will underestimate my feed and spend more money than I need. So how do I get this to the lab in a proper way? What we did, uh, we're just gonna mix everything together we're going to put it right down on the table, like so. Get all that dust out. And then we have a bag. And what we're going to do is just cut it in half and scoop everything right into the bag. So that way, everything got uniformly dumped. We cleaned out one half of the sample. And this will be representative of what we saw in the bale. All right, now, so now that we got our forage test, handled it properly, sent it to the lab, everything came back, and we get the results, there's a whole lot of numbers typically associated with the forage test. We want to highlight certain ones that we think are more crucial in terms of actually being able to meet the protein requirements specifically of the livestock that you have. So Dan, what uh, type of hay did we analyze in our example to share today? So what we did, what you saw us in that hay bale outside, we did a mixed grass hay, a mixed dry hay, mixed grass dry hay. So the sample that, uh, the example that we're going to show you today is not the sample from that hay bale, but a similar type of hay. 
What uh, do you think are the most important values on that forage test that our producers need to understand? So the ones that we're going to look at in terms of making a good balanced feed to meet nutritional requirements of an animal, we're going to look at CP, which stands for crude protein. We're going to look at ADF, which is the acid detergent fiber. And we're going to look at TDN, which is total digestible nutrients. So what uh, crude protein does the hay have? From that All right, so the example we're going to use, um, we're going to look at a 9% crude protein. We're going to look at a 38% AD, ADF. What does that mean, Dan, ADF? So the acid detergent fiber is going to be the, the fiber content of the hay that you have. And acid detergent fiber specifically takes into account the cellulose along with the lignin which is also indigestible. So if you remember from, from your forage physiology classes, as, as the grasses mature, they increase lignin, which typically binds nutrients and increases the fiber content. So the ADF will capture both the cellulose and the lignin. To simplify a little bit, do we want a higher number or a lower number for ADF? We want a lower number because the ADF is gonna be undigestible. Okay, so for ADF, lower is better. What about for TDN? And TDN, which is total digestible nutrients, we are going to use an example of 47%. So as the name implies, only 47% of that hay is digestible. So, in this case with the TDN, the higher the number, the higher quality typically the forage is. And that TDN that takes into account both energy and protein is going to be typically some reflection of the total protein that we have. Usually in most cases, a low crude protein gives you a pretty low TDN and a higher crude protein typically gives you a high TDN for mixed forages, mixed hay. So in this example, Dan, does this meet the requirements for an average brood cow that weighs about 1,200 pounds? For an average brood cow that weighs 1,200 pounds, 9% crude protein level would meet the needs, which is what, Christine? About 7% on average. So we're good with the hay that we have. We are. Uh, when we also look at total digestible nutrients, we need to be around 50% as well. So we're pretty close to what our average mid-gestation beef cow would need to make it through day to day. However, if we looked at a different class of livestock, say a 500 pound calf that we're hoping is gonna gain about two pounds a day, do you think that this is gonna meet the requirements for that animal? So first, let's figure out how much a 500 pound calf can eat. Well, how much is that, Dan? All right, so we got a 500 pound calf, and we'll assume that the quality is pretty good and that calf is going to eat 3% of its weight for approximately 15 pounds of feed. In the previous example, the 1,200 pound cow would eat 36 pounds. But because we're working with a smaller animal, we have to adjust the total intake and make sure that we have enough nutrients to meet it with the lower amount taken in. Right, and so an animal in that situation is gonna need more like 13% crude protein, and the digestibility is going to need up, need to rise a bit from what we saw with that mid-gestation cow. So what is the way we can do that while still utilizing the hay that we have? So that animal needs 13% crude protein. So let's figure out if we use this hay, what we'd get if that animal just eats the hay. Okay. All right, so if we're trying to figure out how much, how much pounds of protein is in 15 pounds of a 9% crude protein hay, we can just simply multiply 15 times 0 0.09, excuse me, uh, which would be 9%, and that would be what we're saying. 1.3 pounds. 1.3 pounds. Okay. Is that enough? 1.3 pounds is probably not enough, but let's find out. So, you said what, 13% crude protein? 
Yes, that's the requirement for that animal. Which would be, let's see, 15 times 0.13 gives you what? Two pounds. Two pounds. So this 9% hay does not meet the nutritional requirements for a 500 pound calf to gain two pounds a day. So how do we meet that need? So we're gonna have to do supplementation because the quality of our hay does not meet the, the need that we need for this, for this rate of gain that we want. So Dan, what would be a good option for a supplemental feed in this situation? Let's use distiller's grains for this example. I think distiller's grains have on average a crude protein of about 30%. Okay. So how do we figure out how much distiller's grain we should supplement with? So let's work backwards. I think we needed two pounds of total protein. And we were, we were about 0.7 pounds short with 9% hay. But let's see if we can supplement one pound using distiller's grains, which is 30% protein. So it would take, so if you're trying to get one pound of protein with 30% three, 30% crude protein, you would need approximately uh, three pounds of distiller's grains to get, it would be 0.9 pounds, but that's pretty close to one pound. Okay, so given what we knew about our hay before and how much feed that this animal can actually consume, the maximum consumption is gonna be about 15 pounds during the day. So if we feed three pounds, of distiller's grains and feed 12 pounds of hay, are we gonna meet the requirement then? Yes. 12 pounds of hay will give you approximately 1.2 pounds of protein, now meeting that two pound requirement that was necessary for the two pounds rate of gain. Great. Okay. So let's look at another example, utilizing the same hay but a different supplemental feed for a different class of livestock. So we know that lactating animals have a higher energy demand and crude protein demand than non-lactating animals. So if we go back to that 1,200 pound cow, and she's a decent milk producer, uh, she's gonna have a greater need for, in her diet. She's right. gonna need about 10.5% uh, crude protein to produce at the level she needs. So we're not way off of what she needs. What are, what's another feed that we can consider? in this situation. Let's look at soybean meal, which is about 50% crude protein. 50% crude protein, right. Right, so, so we know that. How much feed is this animal gonna be able to consume? So now we're back at a 1,200 pound animal. So 1,200 pounds, 3% of that is? 36 pounds. 36 pounds. Now, we have a lot more feed to, uh, to, to, to utilize here. Um, and if, since we're using soybean meal, which is 50% crude protein, um, it's really not gonna take much to figure out exactly how much we need. So how much protein is in one pound then? So if it's 50%, then half a pound for every pound of soybean meal is protein. Right, I would put it as, two pounds of soybean meal is one pound of crude protein. Right. <laughs> that is easy to okay, so in that case, how much hay should we feed versus how much soybean meal? Okay, well, let's figure out how much, what the total necessity of uh, protein that we need um, in terms of pounds. So what's the total pounds that we need um, to give this animal the, uh, what do you say, 13%, 10 point, She's looking at about 10 and a half. 10 and a half percent. percent. Right, protein. which when we do that math, it comes out to about 3.8 pounds of protein is what she needs per day. 3.8 pounds. And remember, she can only consume up to 36 pounds of feed. So we're trying to figure out out of that 36 pounds she has available in the rumen, how much of that is gonna be hay versus how much is gonna be soybean meal. So if, if we take a stab at it and say, we're gonna feed her 30 pounds of hay, how much protein does that provide her? So, 30 pounds of hay at 9%, we're looking at 2.7 pounds of protein. 
So now we're only off on what she needs by one pound, right? Right. One pound of protein. And then that soybean meal is 50% protein. So a couple pounds of soybean meal gives you one pound of protein. And that takes you to your requirements. Which is 3.7, 3.8 pounds. So this is just one example of how you can use your hay test results to actually calculate, calculate your supplemental feed needs. There are all kinds of different rations that you can formulate based on what you had to work with. And to save some of the work, you can also utilize a complete feed available at your feed store to try to meet those needs as well. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to consult your extension office. Your local county educator would be happy to help you. Uh, bring in your feed tags, bring in your forage test, and we would be happy to help you work through uh, what you need to provide for your class of livestock. Hey Dan, let's take a closer look at those uh, feed supplements that we talked about in the video. Sure thing, Christine. Uh, over here, we can see this is what distiller's grains would look like. Um, I think we use this for the example for the 500 the, pound calf. Yes, that's correct. So this is this would be approximately 30% crude protein. And this came from corn, correct? Yes. Okay, and what was our other one? And we also used soybean meal, which you can also buy at your local co-op. And this was about 50%. Yes, protein, and this right? stuff, it doesn't look like it, but it's 50% crude protein. Dan, thanks for joining us on the show today. It's been a pleasure. I had a great time. We'll see you next time in July for the upcoming edition of Forage Focus. Okay, this is our sound check. Dan, sound say check. some stuff. Hey, what's going on? Sound check one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Forage probe. Forage probe. <laughs> hey. We're about to probe this fat bale. flare. Okay. Oh. So it's on. Oh, you know it would be smart. Take the take the cap off. Oh. Boom. There we are. <laughs> Master degrees here, figuring this stuff out. Okay, are we in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you ready? Ready. Are we starting? I, I guess. Do you want me to start talking or do you want you to talk first? So, um, so it's recording, right? Yeah, it's recording. Okay. So, uh, again, welcome to Bell Valley, and uh, we have behind me your typical large round bale. And one of the things you'll notice is an oxidized layer around this bale. I don't know if you guys can see underneath it. Um, maybe we can angle the camera down. No? We can't see it from there. But, um, <laughs> so. On. Start again. All right, so now we're back inside. We have we have our soil, our soil test. We have our forage test, excuse me. Start again. So now we're back inside and we have a forage test with us. We put everything in this bucket, if you recall. And as you can see, you have all kinds of sizes and if I were to just reach in here and pull it out, all that fine dust that's worth a lot of money to you is going right through my fingertips. So how can we avoid that when we actually send a sample to get analyzed? What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the whole mixture, dump it on the table, get all the good stuff out, and now what we can see now is that we just have Everything mixed together, we got all kinds of sizes, and we're just gonna take half the sample and move it straight into a bag. 
right into the bag. And um, what we've done is we've prevented losing any fine material through the scooping grab hand method, which is not the actual name of it. But I won't lose any particles through my fingertips and everything in, this bag, and everything is in the bag. So when I send this out to get analyzed, it's exactly what we pulled out of the bales. Start talking. So now that we got our force test, sent it to the lab. Let's start over. Okay. Okay. Because okay. I forgot what to handle. Okay, great. So looking at these numbers, uh, does this meet the nutrient requirements of what we typically need? Uh, let's say for your average brood cow that's pregnant, does this meet her requirements? Okay. For an average brood cow, we'll assume. 1,200 pound animal. Mid-gestation. Mid-gestation. And that animal will typically ingest about 3% of its body weight. So 3% of 1,200, it's going to be approximately 36 total pounds of forage. Um, if we look at this specific sample, that's 9% crude protein. 9% um, of 36 is what, Christine? We should really just say yes, it is. Cut. So what would be a good option for a supplemental feed for this situation, Dan? So um, something that's really high in protein is soybean meal, um, which would be 50%. But for this example, let's go ahead and go with distiller's grains, which is approximately what percentage? 30%. Which is 30% protein, right? So distillers, <laughs> that's just not right. <laughs> <laughs>